Chapter 7, Informal and Family Caregiving. The objectives for this chapter include identify the kinds of family informal caregiving that exists in communities and the benefits and costs of caregiving, review services and supports for caregivers, as well as future service and program directions, discuss caregiver burden, its consequences, and the approaches to relieve it, and define direct care workers and their characteristics. As we age, we may find that we need the help of family members or an informal caregiver due to injury, disease, disability, or some other reason. Sometimes older adults choose formal care where they pay others to assist them with these needs, but the majority of care provided to older adults is informal care, meaning it is performed by relatives, friends, etc., and goes unpaid. This graph shows how the majority of care is informal care from family caregivers. Many older adults remain in the home receiving family care rather than moving into an assisted living facility. The fact that they have willing family members to provide care allows many to stay in their homes for longer. So what kind of informal care do some older adults need? Well, um, there are levels of informal care. So some older adults may need assistance with instrumental activities of daily living, and we discussed these in a previous chapter. Um, others need assistance with things like emotional support, instrumental activities, personal care, financial help, or contacting and scheduling appointments with service providers. Others might need more advanced nursing care because of an illness such as dementia or recovering from surgery such as hip replacement. And this could include more um, nursing care type needs, more medically related needs and supports. The primary types of care that um, are, is provided by informal caregiving include emotional support, tasks such as transportation, chores, meal prep, grocery shopping, um, some light personal care such as assistance with bathing, um, prepping and feeding, um, getting dressed. There could be issues with um, financial help or like I said before, contacting service providers um, for different various needs. Who are informal caregivers? Um, often it's family members, family caregivers. 29% uh, of all adults in the U.S. provide care to someone. That's 66 million people. Um, and we also consider this to be a shadow workforce, meaning that society generally doesn't recognize informal caregiving. It's kind of invisible. Um, it's work that people do without really being recognized for it. Um, the significant contributions to older adult care by caregivers is generally unsupported, creating what is called a shadow workforce of invisible workers getting no pay for all of their time and effort. What does caregiving look like? Um, it varies by race, gender, social class, sexual orientation, family structure, and more. There is really no standard for what caregiving relationships look like in the U.S. Relationship satisfaction plays a role. Um, if the adult child was not close to their parents, their caregiving relationship may look different. Um, geography also impacts ability to provide close care. Um, family may be organizing care from afar rather than providing it themselves. This is something that's changing um, as we move further from one another. And you can see this graph um, kind of shows what a general caregiver, two out of five caregivers, um, adults are caregivers, and 60% of caregivers are women. Um, the typical caregiver is 49 years old, taking care of her widowed mother and juggling career and family. Um, we talk about this, it's called the sandwich generation, so um, we'll talk more about this in other um, chapters. Um, let's see, the economic value of family caregiving in the U.S. is estimated to be close to $450 billion. This is more than the value of some big companies like Walmart or ExxonMobil. This illustrates the large and often overlooked part families play in health care for older adults. And there are some um, losses and gains of providing informal care. Um, providing all this care without pay or education to do so can be straining or stressful for families. There are both losses and gains when it comes to being a caregiver. Some losses include lack of time, privacy, or feelings of identity. Primary and secondary stressor stressors can occur. 
A primary stressor would be like from the elder's illness, such as a behavioral problem the older adult has because of their health decline, whereas a secondary stressor um, is not directly from the illness, but bleeds over into the caregiver's life. For example, incurring a financial loss due to reduce, reduced hours at your job um, in order to care for your loved one. These stressors are collectively known as caregiver burden, which include the physical, emotional, and financial costs associated with being a caregiver. Um, you can see that the majority of caregivers in this particular study reported some level of caregiver burden. So here's a screenshot from um, results of a study. And we have purple, severe burden, um, red, mild to moderate burden, and green, moderate to severe burden. So pretty much everybody had some sort of mild to severe level of, of burden in caregiving. And this burden is generally seen in two areas, objective or subjective. Um, objective is the daily physical tasks, such as managing their symptoms, driving them to appointments, handling their legal or financial matters for the loved one. Subjective might include the internal emotions or feelings the caregiver has, such as grief, anger, guilt, or worry in this caregiving role. While being a caregiver can be stressful, it can have benefits as well. Um, these two can coexist in a caregiving relationship. Someone can feel both loss and benefit. So benefits might include feelings of confidence, pride, and greater closeness with their loved one. Um, and these are often felt when appreciation is expressed by the loved one being cared for. And these benefits can buffer negative aspects and stress of caregiving. So focusing on some of the positives can be really, really beneficial. Adult children are often the caregivers for their parents, and it's not just a role reversal of taking care of your parents just like they cared for you. This change in roles as a child comes to care for the person who cared for them is often associated with feelings of loss and grief, learning a new way to handle their relationship with their parents, and often conflict with siblings or other family members about care. Um, there's really a gendered nature of caregiving where uh, majority are women. So 66% of caregivers are women. And women spend up to 22 hours per week providing care while men, when they do provide a caregiving role, um, provide about 17 hours. Daughters are twice as likely as sons to be caregivers for their parents. And we have what we call the sandwich generation, which I mentioned before, where uh, parental and child care responsibilities are happening at the same time. And this may be what your parents are doing right now. They're caring for you as you transition into becoming an adult, but they're also caring for their own parents. So they're kind of sandwiched between two and, you know, taking care of um, two groups at the same time. And women caregivers report more subjective burden and higher levels of depression and, and anxiety associated with caregiving. Um, spouses and partners are also providing caregiving. It's a really a large group of caregivers um, for their loved one. And women are more likely to be providing care to their husbands because they live longer, while women tend to receive care from um, family members more so than others. Spouses and partners are the largest group of caregivers, um, performing 80% of caregiving tasks. And spouses and partners as caregivers face their own specific set of challenges in that they're aging and facing health issues as well of their own. And it can seem, um, it can be emotional, emotionally challenging to watch your loved one that you've spent a great deal of your life with in poor health. There's also um, multi-generational multi households are more common amongst non-Caucasian households in the U.S., and so we see um, that these families tend to have stronger cultural values when promoting care for older adults in a positive way. Um, African-American, Latino, Asian-American families provide more informal assistance to their older adult family members as just part of their culture.
Providing care for uh, persons with dementia is its own kind of special category just because it is very challenging. Um, Those caring for people with dementia complete the most hours of care for the longest periods of time and have the most demanding tasks such as bathing, feeding, and incontinence. It's also very um, a very unpredictable illness to be dealing with. There are a lot of personality change. Um, there can be emotional and verbal abuse, aggression, or violent behavior. And it's also very challenging to watch someone you love change in personality and may not even recognize you anymore at the end of their uh, dementia journey. And so not surprisingly, these caregivers report higher emotional stress, more mental and physical health issues, and family conflicts. So you'll see that here in this graphic, dementia caregivers are seven times more likely to experience daily physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion, aka burnouts, than other caregivers. And they're also three times more likely to feel extreme stress from their responsibilities. So thinking about legislation and policies that might support family caregiving, you know, you see it's a very big part of um, U.S. care for older adults is provided by informal caregiving. So what kinds of policies do we have? Um, We don't have a ton. (laughs) Spoiler alert. We don't have a ton in the U.S. But we do have the Family and Medical Leave Act, which provides 12 weeks of unpaid leave to care for a spouse or parent with a serious health condition. Now, the benefit the benefits do not apply to small companies or businesses, so not everybody can get this. So if you're working for a small um, corporate, not a corporation, but a small business, you might not have access to FMLA. And unfortunately, this is unpaid time off. So not everybody can afford to utilize FMLA if they can't lose their salary while they're providing care to their loved one. There's also the National Family Caregiver Support, funded by the Administration on Aging. Um, This provides service to low-income older caregivers um, to support their needs. And, for example, like bigger corporations, Microsoft and Cigna, both offer four weeks of paid leave for caregivers with eight additional weeks of unpaid time. So out of those 12 weeks, you can get the first four weeks still paid, which can be really, really helpful when... Um, you just need a short-term temporary, you know, maybe following a hip surgery or something to care for someone. And then some companies and businesses have informal policies that promote caregiving for their workers, such as flex hours. So allowing them to kind of switch up the hours that they do work um, so that they can do caregiving and work. Um, Services and support for caregivers. Um, You know, it's important that caregivers have access to things that will help them do this hard work. Um, And so there are supports for them, but they're not always being used. So why don't caregivers use services? Well, family caregivers are often just unaware of the options to help them. They cannot afford things like in-home nursing care, um, or they resist accepting help because they just feel like they are the ones that should be helping their family members and not someone else. Um, And then in families of color, They feel that care is out of love and um, that they, again, they should be providing the care. It's their responsibility. Um, Or they don't even really recognize that they are a caregiver. They just see it as this is what you do. You take care of your family. And they don't identify with being a caregiver and, and needing extra support. So what are some supports that work? Well, evidence-based interventions that have been effective include psychoeducational groups um, that can really support um, caregiver well-being, modifying the home, so changing the home to support older adults, especially those with dementia. Um, It could be physical things or safety things that you're doing to the home to really make it so that the person can remain there. Or respite care, which is... Um, planned or emergency short-term relief for the caregiver. So basically being able to have someone else watch the older adult for a period of time so that you can go on a much-needed vacation or just take a break and get caught up on your work, whatever it is. And future service directions, um, really just thinking about how can we make support services culturally competent. So 
really accessible to all different types of family and different types of caregiving situations. And then just making people really aware of these options so that they can access them. And finally, teaching caregivers to provide self-care. So thinking about putting on your own oxygen mask first before putting it on those around you um, as a metaphor. Really teaching caregivers to take care of themselves so that they can properly care for others. So speaking of this stress in um, caregiving, let's look at caregiver burden. Um, when the burden of caregiving becomes too much for family members, they may make the decision to place their family into long-term care facilities. Um, some reasons for placement include the ability to provide the care that the person really needs, um, access to the caregiver's resources, and uh, maybe a lack of a support network. So often this can be you know, maybe someone has dementia and the support they need is 24-7 care because of behavioral issues and the caregiver cannot provide that. And so maybe that's a reason why they are moved into a long-term care facility. Additionally, the perceived burden of care, negative family relationships, or lack of confidence to provide care may influence a caregiver's decision to put them into long-term care. And there are generally negative attitudes regarding moving a family member into long-term term care, which can lead to a lot of stress in making the decision for family members. Um, caregivers may feel stress, grief, loss, guilt, and fear, including feeling as though they failed their family member. And really, they're just kind of changing their role. They're having to um, give up the kind of control they have over taking care of their loved one and trust in someone else to do that for them. And so that can be really challenging as they change their role. In some cases, very um, few cases, elder mistreatment may occur by caregivers. This is not necessarily due to high caregiving burden, but it can play a role. Um, those who mistreat older adults tend to have more mental and physical health issues, alcohol or drug dependence, financial troubles, or resentment toward the care recipient. So overall, it's really hard to know how many older adults are being abused as many cases go unreported. Um, studies find anywhere from 10 to 14% of older adults facing abuse in the home. Um, and you can think about why these things may go unreported. Older adults that um, need a caregiver feel as though they cannot um, tell on their caregiver because then they'll have nobody to take care of them. So they feel like they are kind of stuck and cannot get out of the situation or get the assistance they need. So unfortunately, that's why it often goes unreported. There are a number of different elder abuse or elder mistreatment categories. We have neglect, physical abuse, financial abuse, emotional abuse, and abandonment. Um, neglect is the most often reported because it's easier to notice. It's just um, intentionally failing to meet the physical, social, or emotional needs of the older person. So um, someone just not having enough food, not having shelter, not having clothing, just being left um, neglected is pretty, um, it's easier to notice from a third party perspective. Financial, emotional, and abandonment are less often reported, reported and are harder to see happening. Um, so for example, financial abuse, you know, can range from misuse of funds to embezzlement, you know, kind of just taking control of someone's financial situation and using their money for your own gains rather than, um, making sure to spend it on things for them. Emotional can just be, um, emotional abuse is, you know, name calling or making the person feel bad or feel out of control, feel, um, that you have, you know, the last say of what their situation is going to be like. So I can all fall under emotional abuse and abandonment is um, really kind of like an extreme form of neglect. So really just not providing, just leaving completely the person to be self-sufficient when they cannot. And then um, obviously physical is something that can be more easily noticed if it's seen happening or if the older adult has bruises, um, it can range from slapping or shoving to more severe abuse. And so these are things that um, can be noticed more often by a diligent nurse or doctor.
And again, like I said, care recipients often rely on caregivers and fear retaliation if they report. So it, this is some of the reasons why it goes unreported. Okay, to summarize this chapter, um, most of the caregiving in the U.S. is completed by family caregivers rather than paid care. Um, caregivers experience both benefits and struggles, and we kind of talked about what those might be. Caregiving burden may be larger for women and those caring for someone with dementia. Caregivers are not always seeking resources for a variety of reasons, such as not seeing themselves as a caregiver. And caregiving burden can cause mental and health issues among caregivers.